the theme today, Dan, is bringing joy to your photo library, organizing an on-one photo raw. Tell <laughs> All right, well, let's take it away here. Let me share my screen so we can get started. Uh, first off, I've never watched that Marie Kondo or whoever it is who, who does all the bringing joy stuff. Someone created that description for me, so I hope I live up to whatever it is that she does. So uh, as we all enter our, this is our third week of quarantine at my house, uh, organizing your photo backlog actually sounds like an exciting thing to do. <laughs> uh, I thought what I would do is I would spend a little time going over some strategies on your, basically the structure of your photo library, how to get it organized. I'll walk you through some of the, the tips for it now, because this is a kind of a smaller group and there's lots of time to ask questions, put your questions in the chat module and Nathan will kind of shout those out as we go here. Uh, this is uh, going to be a little bit more conversational, a little less uh, full-on editing style demo. It's mostly about organization. So we're going to talk a little bit more about some of the uh, rules and ideas around it. So for me, I kind of put this into a stepwise fashion of things you need to do to get organized. And the very first thing you need to do is you need to consolidate. You got to get all of your photos into the same place. Many of us have multiple drives, multiple computers. Uh, the folks that I talk to will have three or four external hard drives, many of which are not backed up. Many of them have multiple copies of the same photo library, the same photos on multiple drives. You're not sure which one has the correct settings, which one has the right metadata, which one has your edits on it. It becomes a big mess when you do that. So for me, I think the first thing to do is to get all your photos into one place. The question comes, what do I use to get all those photos into one place, especially if I have a lot, a lot of photos. Uh, so my wife and I, I don't know if you guys know uh, Whitney, uh, my wife, uh, she uh, is a portrait and wedding photographer and we have hundreds of thousands of photos. So I'll tell you the solution that we used for her. Uh, we purchased a RAID drive, if you guys aren't familiar with RAID, it's a concept where you can take multiple hard drives and kind of chain them together uh, so they act as one big drive. It's, I can't remember what it stands for, it's like redundant array of cheap drives or something like that. And you can buy them. They're actually not that expensive these days. And we have one, I think it's an eight terabyte one, if I recall. And with that, we're able to take all the photos and put them onto one place. The other cool thing about a RAID drive is uh, they come at different levels. And we use what's called a RAID zero drive, which means it is mirrored. So it's really two or four drives together. And everything you put on it gets back up to another drive within that same enclosure. So we have this one from let's see, it's basically got two eight terabyte drives in it. Each eight terabyte drive mirrors the other. So that way everything is backed up. So you can keep all your photos in one place and then everything's backed up all at the same time. So it's a pretty great way to get started. And let's see, what else can we talk about here? One of the things that people forget is that PhotoRaw is a browser. So you can actually use it to do your creating subfolders, moving files and folders around, viewing your drives, let me show you. So if I just jump over here to Photo Raw and I click on my Browse tab over here, I'm going to see my local drives and I can browse those drives just like they're a drive because that's what they are. You don't have to go through and, and uh, import all your photos into us to be able to browse them. You can just simply use the Browse tab, go to any of your drives, navigate through them, create subfolders, drag and drop files and folders. So it's a very common way of working. It's a great way to do it. So for example, if I was to come into this folder, Let's go into my inbox here and I'll explain my organizational structure here in a minute as we move along. And I've got some mobile test photos here. So these are all shot with our actually our new on one mobile phone app. And I kind of just dumped them all in here together. So you can see they're kind of misorganized. Well, it's very simple for me to create a new subfolder and to drag and drop photos into other ones. So I'm just going to look, come in here. I'm going to add a subfolder and I'm just going to call this one beach. There'll be a new folder that'll appear in here. And then I can take all of the beachy photos and I can move them into that subfolder. And actually if I scroll down here to the bottom, my new beach folder, where'd it go? Somewhere in here will be my new beach folder I just added. Sorry, my internet connection is not the fastest out here in the studio today. So you might, might see a little bit of lagging going on. I can just simply grab those and drag them around. So I'm just going to Come down here, let's go to that folder I was just looking at. There's my on one mobile test folder. You can see that beach subfolder over here on the left that I created. And then I can just, by multi-selecting, I can click any of the photos that I need to put into that category. I can create 
and select as many of these guys as I need to. So there we go. And then I can just drag those into that subfolder. And this will start that organizational process. So as I mentioned, you can browse drives, you can browse folders, you can create new folders, you can move your photos around and you can delete your photos all from inside a browser. You don't have to go to another browser or another application window or your finder or explorer window to do that work. It's a browser at its heart and a pretty fast one at that. Gee, Dan, that was really cool. So <laughs> it's uh... not super exciting, but a lot of people actually forget that you can do that kind of stuff across. Awesome. So if you're new to on one and say you have hundreds of photos and you don't know where to begin uh, without feeling too overwhelmed, where would you recommend to start? So if you're just getting into it, let me jump back here. The easiest way to get started is actually just to browse them. So as I mentioned over here in browse, there's the my catalogs tab. We'll talk about the benefits of that in a minute. And there's a browse tab. When you click on browse at the top, you'll see your local drive and you can navigate to wherever those live. If that's a little scary for you, you can always go up to browse and say browse folder, and you can use the normal operating system style dialog and point it to wherever your photos live. Uh, that's an easy way to do it too. Thanks, Dan. Yes. Yeah. All right, now as part of this, don't forget about your mobile photos. We all shoot lots of pictures on our phone and they oftentimes get treated as a second class citizen. There are some photos in there that we probably care about, ones that we want to hold on to and save. So we need to have a strategy that's going to let us get our photos off of our phones and back to our desktop computers. And that's something that's going to be coming with on one sync here very soon. That'll make it a much easier process than it is today. Today, there's a lot of different ways to do that. Uh, some people will use a cloud syncing service like Dropbox, but a lot of us will just use the USB cable that comes with our phones and we'll plug our phone into our computer, just like we plug our camera into our computer, or our card reader into our computer, and we'll download those photos periodically. And we kind of stick them in a folder and then we never go back and organize and look at them again. That's one of the, one of the problems we have today. Uh, so yeah, don't forget about your, your mobile photos. Uh, some people who are a little bit more organized will actually use like the heart or a flag in their mobile device and they can filter on just the ones they care about and import those rather than having to import all of your photos. But that also kind of comes back to your personal philosophy around culling. We'll get to that as well. All right, any questions on how to get all of your photos together into one place and a safe way of storing those before I move on to step two? I would say we have a lot of opinions on the RAID system. Uh... I yeah. don't know if uh, they're a little PG-13, so I won't, I'll spare you those. But I think we have some people out there that uh, might have differing opinions than you on that. And uh, I would just remind everybody, um, if, if they're looking for like kind of a deep dive on storage and backup, we have a tons of videos in our video library. And we've actually opened up all our Plus courses uh, to stream for anybody. So if you want to go out there and check those out, we've got courses on digital asset management and multiple um, videos kind of talking about uh, what we're covering today, but in more depth and, uh, and kind of going through each um, individual option you would have available at each step. We do have a couple of questions, Dan, before you move on. The first one okay. comes from Bree. Um, you were mentioning multiple copies of the same image with different metadata, different versions and sizes. How do you deal with organizing those? Do you, feel, do you keep just the best version or the largest file? Uh, that's a good question. And then there's not a, a uh... Uh, there's not a solid answer to that one. Uh, and a little bit later, I'm actually going to show you guys a little standalone app that I find super handy for helping me find duplicates. And part of that duplicate process is it'll tell me about each photo. It'll tell me which one's bigger, which one might be the original, uh, which one has other metadata, things like that. But it probably comes down to an individual decision. It's going to depend on what's more important to you. Is it the edit that you've done or having the original data uh, or both? You're going to have to kind of see a lot of times your exported JPEGs you might have made created for a project at one point. There's no point in keeping, keeping those again. So, uh, Here's a great question, Dan. Malcolm wants to know, what is the limit to the number of photos you can display the thumbnails of? And if I have, say, 20,000 photos and not as on one slow or not as snappy, what can I do to alleviate that? Ah, okay. Hi, Malcolm. Um, in terms of the maximum number of thumbnails you can display, I don't honestly believe there is one. Now, there are a couple of things you could do to make it faster. Uh, one is to catalog them. That makes a huge, huge difference in the performance of it. And I'll kind of explain what cataloging is and what the benefit is of that here in a minute. Um, the difference between simply browsing a photo versus having one that we catalog 
uh, has a big performance impact between the two. So I would definitely recommend cataloging your stuff. I'll give you some ways to catalog that will be easier on your machine and take up a lot less hard drive space here in a second. Any other questions, Nathan? Uh, next question comes from Mark. Mark would know how can you group two photos of several photos together in one stack to take up less room in your library? Ah, so the way I would do that, especially for things like uh, HDR brackets or panorama brackets, is you can actually create a subfolder. And I'll show you how to do that. Just a little, like two more slides. There's actually kind of a step where I'll show how I would actually do that. Mm -hmm. uh, because we show subfolders in the grid view, uh, just like we would show a thumbnail, and we have a really handy feature for creating subfolders that will actually take the name of the photo and it actually shows you the first photo in your stack, your stack being a subfolder. It really works just like stacks do inside of Lightroom, but the great thing is you can view them across every application. So if you're using an app other than on one, you're not gonna lose all your stacking. It's just gonna be inside of a simple, normal subfolder, but it works just like a stack does in Lightroom. Awesome, right. thank you, Dan. Well, we haven't even got to the controversial. I was just going to say, I've got a lot of great <laughs> questions here. controversial. I'm <laughs> uh, right. I know there's probably a lot of people who have been burned by RAID arrays in the past or by having uh, using a software RAID rather than a hardware RAID. Uh, I would always recommend doing a hardware RAID and not letting the RAID be your backup. The RAID is one level of backup. And that brings us to our next topic, having a solid backup strategy. So. Uh, for us, what we do, we keep that RAID uh, drive. That's where we keep all the original photos. And yes, it does have a mirrored copy uh, in it so that if one drive dies, I can always use the other drive to get the photos off of it. But that's still not considered our primary backup. What we actually do for our backup is we have another, we'll call it NAS, the Network Area Storage Device, which is geographically differently located. That's a key thing. If you had your backup drive and your main drive attached to your computer and you have a fire or a flood, your backup goes away the same as your original one. You have to keep your backup somewhere else. Now, the easiest way for most people to do that is to do it in the cloud. Just use a cloud storage service like Dropbox or Google Drive or Backblaze, someplace where you can store copies into the cloud. That way they're accessible anywhere, they're backed up multiple ways, that's a good way to do it. If you have a lot of photos, the cloud can get pretty expensive pretty quickly though. Whereas you can get a NAS, a network area storage device for quite a bit less. You know, you can spend a few hundred dollars and get a big NAS and just put it somewhere else. So for us, our uh, main RAID drive lives in the studio, but we have the NAS at home and it just backs up over the network every night. It just goes through and see what photos are different. There's a utility uh, that runs on the desktop computer where the RAID drive is attached that compares the RAID drive to the NAS drive and just syndicates any differences to it. That way I've got another backup that's in a completely different place. The other cool thing about it is I can also access that NAS from anywhere in the world, so I can easily go grab another photo if I had to. All right, any other questions about backup? Again, you want to make sure you have a good solid backup strategy. All of your photos are backed up. They're all located in the same place, and you want to have that backup in a different physical location than where the photos live. Uh, nothing nothing on this topic. No, Dan, I think that you covered most of that. Again, um, I did get a question, people asking if the Plus videos were for free. And um, yes, they are. So you can go watch the Plus videos for free. So all the videos on the video library are unlocked at the moment. So anybody can watch them. We have a tons of backup options and storage options on there. I'd encourage everyone to go check that out if you're looking for more detail in these areas. We do have a couple questions, Dan, about kind of integrating the Apple photos into your workflow. So maybe you can touch on that at some point in your presentation today. Sure. Um, if you use, if you're an Apple user and you use Apple Photos, which isn't a bad way to go at all, especially if you're an iPhone user, uh, if you use their cloud storage, which is kind of the default way of working, all of the photos that you shoot will get stored in iCloud. They'll be viewable on all of your devices, and then you would simply be using uh, Photo Raw as a plugin to Apple Photos, and that's where you could go and do some of your editing if you needed to create a layered file or you wanted to do things that you could do in effect, things you can't do with the built-in editing in Apple Photos, that's how you would take advantage of it. And Apple makes that pretty seamless. Everything is backed up for you through, uh, through the iCloud Drive system instead. Again, still gets expensive if you shoot a lot. So I think if you're a, a part-time shooter, an enthusiast, that's an acceptable way to go. If you're a professional, uh, the storage costs will probably get pretty expensive pretty quickly if you're shooting raw photos. It's a great system for JPEGs or for hike files, but for raw photos, those eat up space pretty darn quickly. All right, so let's move on to step three, and that's determining how you actually want to organize your photos. 
so there's some, and this is, this is going to be the controversial topic actually, <laughs> is the organizing your photos. So there's several different ways to do it. I'm a firm believer in using files and folders on disk as your main way of organizing. The great thing about this is it's independent of the application that you use. Anyone who's been in the business as long as I have knows that applications and file formats can come and go. Uh, many of us probably remember all this fetch from you know 25 years ago that we used for our file uh, organization. It's long gone at this point, but if you kept all of your uh, files and folders in a logical folder structure, you can navigate from system to system, still find all your stuff and your organization will be preserved. Same thing with people who used uh, uh, Apple Aperture, you know, something where it kind of locks all of your photos into one system and the organizational constructs are dependent upon that application. You lose that when you go to another app. Keeping it in files and folders, you don't have to worry about that. Now, the question is, how do you organize those files and folders? So you could organize them by your subject matter. You could organize them by clients. If you're a professional, that's the way most professionals do it, is based by client. Or you can organize by date. Now, for me, I always recommend organizing by subject matter instead. And there's a simple reason why. Every photo, when you capture it, has the date recorded into it. That is instantly searchable by an application like PhotoRod. It's easy to find things by date. But if I keep everything organized by date and I don't have any other information about what the photos are, now I'm dependent on using keywords or some other way of tagging those photos to know what they actually are, what they actually mean. Because when I go look for a photo, I'm looking for a photo of something. I'm not looking for a photo on a certain date. So instead, if you organize by date, you're forced into going to your calendar and figuring out when did I go shoot. So if I'm looking for pictures from Yosemite, rather than being able to search for Yosemite, now I have to go to my calendar, search for Yosemite, find out when I shot those pictures of Yosemite, and then go explore by date folders. That seems like kind of a backwards way of organizing to me. Whereas if I organize based on subject matter, I can simply just drill down through my folders and find my photos super fast without having to add any keywords. So let me show you. This is the way that I do it. So I'm going to go over to my catalog folders over here, and I'm going to open up my personal photos right here. And again, this is the way I do it. Everybody kind of have their own way of doing it. I organize based by top level subject matter. So I have aircraft and animals, architecture, commercial elements, landscapes. And for each one of these, I roll down and it gets more and more granular. So if I go inside of landscape and I roll it down, it's going to break it down by country. And then inside of a country, it'll break it down by state or by province where I shoot. I live in Oregon. So there's lots of stuff in Oregon. Let's go there. I roll down Oregon. I'll see different sub locations inside of Oregon. There's Smith Rock. So I can pretty quickly go find just the photos I photographed at Smith Rock just by drilling down through that folder structure. I don't have to know when those photos were captured. I just have to know what it is that I'm looking for. So it's a very quick way to do your organizing. Let's go and drill through another one. Let's go to architecture. Let's say I'm looking for pictures I shot in Rome. So I know that I'm going to architecture. I'll go to Italy. I'll go to Rome. And there we go. There's all the pictures I shot in Rome. I don't need to know that I shot those pictures in Rome in whenever the heck it was, 2011 probably? 2004, so pretty old ones actually. Uh, I wouldn't have to go dig by the date, I can just dig by the subject map. All right, questions on that? That's usually the most divisive topic is how to organize your photos. Well, I'm just waiting to see who the first person is that comes in and says they organize their by their name their folders by years and then months and then dates. There are um, lots of people that do that. There's yeah. lots of people who do that, and and for some reason, uh, some organizers do it that do it that way by default. Like Lightroom, uh, when you import, they have a organize it by date option for you. Again, I find that to be a, a fairly weak way of organizing your photos because I don't know when I shot something. I know what I want to go find. I don't want to have to go search for it. The other well, cool Dan, thing is, yeah. Sorry um, to cut you off there, Dan. Go ahead. The uh, the folders that you build out, so the folders you put things in, that folder path is is searchable, just like a keyword. So I didn't have to go add the keyword Rome to every one of these photos. It's in my folder for Rome. So watch, I could be up here at the very top level of my catalog. I want to go find those Rome pictures. I don't even have to dig through anything. I can just open up my advanced search section here. And I'm just going to make sure I'm searching my catalog photos. And in the search field here, I can just type in Rome and it'll go find those same Rome pictures just like that without having to add any keywords. 
because to be honest, I hate keywords. That's way too much work for me. So I will rarely add keywords there. That's your device, divisive topic for the day right there. I don't <laughs> like keywords. Uh, <laughs> keywords can be really handy, but they're just a lot of work. I mean, that's like cleaning your garage. I hate having to add keywords. And you know, I've been doing this for 30 years now, and I still don't like adding keywords. It's just a lot of work. Now, if I was a stock photographer and my living was made off of keywords, that would probably be different. But honestly, how many of us are stock photographers and have to find that exact one photo that quickly or have as many photos? No, let's see. What else do we have here? Well, I got a question for you. So, Dan, you mm -hmm. mentioned Lightroom earlier, and uh, we got a question from Joe here. He's got about 8,000 old photos that are cataloged within Lightroom, and mm -hmm. he wants to know if he should just uh, migrate those over or just pull the important photos as he uses them. What would you recommend? Mm, 8,000 isn't that many. I would probably just bring them all over. Uh, that's not that many. If I had uh, 100,000, then I'd probably go at it a little bit differently. I might not bring them all over. I might bring over just the, the ones that I care about. But 8,000 is a pretty small number. I just take them all at that point. And back to, um, back to Apple Photos, since we were talking about it earlier. So um, John wants to know, you know, what's the best way to get these photos into On One Photo Raw um, from from his iPhone or uh, in Google Photos. And, and so I'll just answer this like me personally, for the time being, I just export everything out into a folder, uh, my iPhone folder, and then I have that stored locally. Um, but we're, we're gonna be able to uh, make that uh, jump and make that uh, workflow a lot more seamless here in the future. Um, Dan, did you have anything else to add? Well, I actually do something pretty similar. And this is one thing that um, I'll show you guys. So in my, my personal photos, I keep all my photos in one folder called my personal photos. That way everything's all in one spot. And I organize it into those subcategories. But you notice at the top, there's one called my inbox. My inbox is where I keep any new job that I haven't had a chance to go through and do my work on. So if I roll down the inbox, you'll see in here, there's a few things that I haven't had a chance to go through. This is where I'm going to go through and I'm going to do my calling, my rating, any additional stuff before they get filed away into one of these proper categories. And all of the ones that I shoot on my iPhone will get dumped into this inbox folder. And then I'll go through and I'll throw away 90% of them because they're pictures of whiteboards or the accidental screenshots that I take with my iPhone or uh, 12 of the same photo. I only need the best one of those photos. So then I'll take the ones I care about and I'll file them away where they properly go. Um, right, so I think one of the other topics we want to talk about was catalog folders. So as I mentioned, if you take your photos and you put them into a catalog folder, and it simply just means it's a folder we keep an eye on. So we go out and we look at all the metadata for the photos. We put that into a local database and we build previews so that we can show them to you quicker. We'll make a small thumbnail size preview. We'll make a bigger, higher quality preview that you'll see like all the ones you see right now are kind of that higher quality preview. And then we also make a fit screen version as well. Now, if you do all that, that can take up quite a bit of space on your, on your hard drive, depending on the number of photos that you have. So I'm gonna show you two things you can do to help control the size of those. The first one is when you create a catalog folder, or you can do this after the fact, if you right click on it, under the preview size section, you can choose the size of the previews that we generate. So there's a minimal option. That's gonna be just the tiniest little thumbnail and all the metadata. If you're the kind of person who has hundreds of thousands of photos and you store them on like a file server, that minimal option is the one that you're going to want. It's still going to make all of your metadata searchable. It's still going to give you a thumbnail that you could recognize the photo with, but it's going to take the least amount of hard drive space on your computer that you're working on. The medium is the one that I use most of the time. That's going to create a high quality thumbnail and all of the metadata. And then the standard size one, that's the one that's going to create a full screen preview. Now I work on a 5k iMac. So that means that it's going to create basically a four to 5,000 pixel JPEG preview for every single photo of my catalog. On most of my photos, that's 100% size. That's a lot of space that it can end up creating for those JPEGs. And the only time the full size one gets used is when I'm in detail view and I'm comparing multiple photos. And we can generate those on the fly instead. So I tend to recommend using the medium option for most users. The other thing you can do is you can choose where those previews get stored. And you do this in your preferences up here under the system tab right here where it says browse cache this controls where those guys live so by default we're going to store it on your main drive of your computer that you're installed on but you can move it to a different location which can be pretty handy especially if you have a small ssd for your boot drive 
you can target it towards a different drive. So if you have an external SSD that's nice and fast, that's a great place to put it. You just simply click on the move button and target it towards that drive. Now keep in mind that drive needs to be attached in order for us to use those cached photos. All right, I'm gonna pause there because there might be a couple questions. Yeah, definitely. And I just wanna go back and talk about the difference between the My Catalogs and the Browse tab, Dan. Those are two kind of completely different areas. The screen share you're showing, you've got quite a bit of catalog folders there. So mm -hmm. it might not be obvious for everybody to notice that the Browse tab is just browsing your system and the catalogs are actually folders that you have designated as catalog folders. You want to show them the difference there, Dan? Yeah. Yeah. And that's actually a kind of a new difference. We used to kind of mix the two together until just recently. So if you haven't actually installed your 2020.1 update, you might actually just see those together in a single tab. And actually, if you prefer that old view, you can change that back in the preferences too. You can come into somewhere in here. Where's it live? Ah, legacy browse tab right there. If you like the old look, you can turn it on there. But we've kind of purposely separated those two because people were confused about the difference between browsing and cataloging. So on the browse tab, we're going to focus on drives and their folders that live inside of them. So at the top, you'll see local drives. So any hard drive that's attached to my computer will show up in here. So you see there's Macintosh hard drive. There I've got another drive called my passport that's attached. It has some external photos on it. There's my backup drive. And then below that, you're also gonna see your cloud storage. So if you're using any cloud storage services like Google Drive or Dropbox, you'll see your contents that are stored on your computer for those services that live in here. Everything I'm looking at in here, I'm just simply browsing as a fast browser, but I'm not gonna be able to view contents across multiple drives. I'm not gonna be able to search across multiple drives or folders like I can once it's cataloged. So the things that you create as catalog folders now live over here under my catalog. I have three of them. Most people are probably only going to have one or two of them. Normally, I would just have this personal photos catalog folder it would be the only one that I would have. But because I also have my work demo photos on here, I've got a catalog for those. And I've got this other one that I'm working on right now. I'm doing some cleanup of my own. I've got an old folder that has like 15,000 photos from my iPhone from years ago that I haven't had a chance to go through and clean up yet. So I've cataloged those now to make it easier for me to go through and pick out the few out of that that I actually care about. Yeah, and again, those are the catalog folders aren't actually storing anything. All your edits and everything you do inside on one, whether you're working in the browse tab or the my catalogs tab, is all being stored non destructively in sidecar. So that cataloging is really just a, a watch. It's making those folders run fat, uh, those thumbnails load faster and, and do all the things that Dan just mentioned. Yeah, the other thing it lets you do is it lets you do those searching across multiple folders. So if you remember mm -hmm. when I went back and I searched for Rome, if it's in the catalog folder right here from this little pop-up in the search pane, I can choose what we're actually searching. So normally it's only just going to search whatever the photos are in the current view, the current folder or the current album that I'm looking at. But I can also tell it to search my catalog folders or if I'm using on one sync to search my sync photos as well. That's coming soon. What you're looking at today is actually kind of a pre-release build. So hopefully I'm not showing you guys anything too secret today. Uh, so a lot okay. of times I would just go and say search my catalog folders like this one, it's going to go and search all my catalog folders for something that I type in or filter for. Uh, the other cool thing that it can do is you can also use what's called show subfolder contents down here. So if I'm in a folder, let's say I go to my aircraft folder here, I've got subfolders in here for different types of airplanes. If I just turn this show subfolder contents option on, I can see all of the photos and all of the subfolders at once. So it makes it a lot faster to look across subfolders and to search across subfolders as well. And you can do that even with a really big collection of photos. All right, now let's see, what else do we have on the docket here? Do to do, do, do so we kind of talk about the benefits of cataloging and how to get the most out of cataloging. So doing those couple things I mentioned, if you have a really large collection, turning your preview site down and targeting your cache to a different drive will make cataloging behave a lot better for you. Um, and you don't ever have to worry about backing up your catalog. Isn't that right, Dan? Well, you should back up your catalog, but it's part of your whole system backup. That catalog lives right. on your computer as part of your user folder. And as you back up your computer, that's going to get backed up as well. Internally, it also backs itself up automatically so that every time you launch it, it's going to create a backup copy of the catalog. I think it keeps three or four backup copies at any given moment so that if for some reason, 
a catalog gets corrupted, which is pretty rare, it'll automatically fall back to the previous backup. Um, it's very, very rare that happens and you don't even really notice when it does do that. Everything you do also gets written to the sidecar file. So for all of your photos, there's a little dot on one file that lives next to them. That contains all the metadata and all the settings as a backup. So that if you move that to another computer outside of Photo Raw, you're not gonna lose those settings either. All right, uh, do, 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 do. one other thing we're gonna talk about is the difference between albums and folders and when you wanna use one versus the other. So let me jump back to Photo Raw. We'll talk a little bit about an album. So in some applications, you would create an album or a collection as an organizational construct to replace folders because they didn't support folders. You know, think something like Apple Aperture. Uh, or even iPhoto can do this at time, would do this, where you didn't really see the files and folders where things lived on disk. So if you wanted to organize things like files and folders, you'd end up creating an album or a collection, whatever they happen to call it, and you'd end up recreating that folder structure. That you don't want to do. You want to organize things in a normal folder structure. What an album's job is, is to keep track of photos either for a specific project that you're working on, or to keep track of a list of photos that spans multiple folders or multiple drives. So for example, if I go over here to my recent favorites album, this actually contains photos from lots of different subfolders and it lets me put them all together at once. That's what you would use an album for. If you're looking for either photos for a project or photos that live across multiple locations. If it's simple organization of your photos at the root level, you just want to use files and folders instead. Any questions about that before I move on? You can create nested albums, of course. So you can nest albums as deeply as you want. So for example, you can make one for your portfolio and then inside of it have different subcategories of your portfolio for different kinds of clients. You know, here's my people portfolio, here's my landscape portfolio. Still have them organized within one master album that contains everything. Right, so some people look at this as the one-to-one -one comparison of what Lightroom calls a collection. We got that question in here. Yep, yeah, it works very much like a collection does uh, a little bit more flexibility in the organization on our side, but pretty much the same idea as a collection. Can you elaborate a little bit on um, what you mean by albums for multiple locations, Dan? Yeah. So for example, if we look at this one, so this folder photo here, if I say show in the folders, okay, reveal in folders here, it happens to live in this subfolder of my inbox called my Palouse trip. These are all photos I took. Uh, in the Palouse. If I go back to that album, I could pick a different one. Let's see, that's my recent favorites. Let's grab one oh, here, and I say show in or reveal in the folders. This one's from a completely different place. This one happens to actually be inside of my develop folder. Instead, it happened to be a sample photo I had grabbed. But they can live in any folder and still be represented inside of one album. So rather than having to, if you thought about it just as a, as a file and folder, if you want to do that, you'd have to make copies of your photos and put them into a subfolder to do the same thing. And that's what we're trying to avoid is creating copies of your photos when we can just create a reference for it instead. Same thing if you want to have multiple uh, editing versions of a photo. You don't have to duplicate the photo to have different settings. You can just create a version instead. You can have as many different editing settings on a photo just stored in different versions. Right. Anything else there, Nathan? Yeah, definitely. There's a lot of good questions coming in, Dan. So um, okay. let's talk a little bit more about that backup thing. When we're, we were talking about uh, no need to back up your catalog because it's done with the system backup. So what if you have like a file list backup system where you list out the exact files that you want to be backed up? What would you recommend in those scenarios, Dan? Uh, Is there a catalog file somewhere that a user could find and, and designate that be backed up? How would you recommend someone yeah. make sure that they uh, preserve those edits? Yeah, so if, you, if you're not doing a whole system backup, you're, you're targeting certain files or certain folders for it. Uh, on the Mac, you want to back up your library application support on one folder, uh, and that will catch everything on one does. And if you're on Windows, it would be um, C users, app data, roaming, local, on one. I know that's a horrible one. Uh, mm -hmm. I believe there is a knowledge base that actually has those, or maybe Nathan can uh, type those into the chat so you guys can see those. But that's where we're going to store all of the caches, all of the uh, database files, anything you do outside of those sidecars will get stored into that folder. Mm -hmm. 
So Dan, when you were um, inside on one, and if you have, this question comes again from Joe, Lightroom warns you to not move your photo files unless you're doing so within Lightroom. If you place photos in Lightroom into another folder and on one, does it physically change the original location of the photo? Yes. So if you move things from folder A to folder B, you are moving that uh, photo from folder A to folder B. One thing that can happen with a lot of other editors, I know this will happen at Lightroom, if you move a photo outside of it, it loses track of it. It doesn't know where that photo went to. Uh, the cool thing about catalog folders is we fix that automatically. So if you move something outside of our world, we'll still discover it if it's inside of a catalog folder. If not, you'll discover the next time you browse to it. In Lightroom, you'd right click on a folder and say synchronize it, and then it goes out and finds all the changes that you've made to it uh, outside of this world. We just kind of resolve that stuff automatically in a catalog folder. All right, well, let's head on to our next yeah. topic here. Let me make sure I hit everything in there. Uh, fundamental organizing, cataloging, albums or folders. We talked a little bit about metadata. Again, uh, I find metadata quite tedious and I prefer just to organize things by files and folders. Not to say that metadata isn't the right solution for you, especially depending on, uh, on how many photos you have and what you do with your photos. If you're a professional, adding additional metadata can be helpful. Uh, you can add certain things like, uh, say, if you're a wedding photographer, you might want to add the location of the events or the vendor names to it so that when someone from a certain church contacts you and say, hey, do you have any pictures of our church? It's easy for you to find those, for example. Or if you're a stock photographer, uh, add the, simply adding the location might not be enough metadata. You may need to add additional uh, metadata to a photo to make it useful for finding in stock. But again, not that many of us are stock photographers. so. Just organizing by folders will solve 90% of the problems for you. All right, so now let's talk about culling. So actually this is probably the most contentious topic that we'll, we'll reach today is what is your, what's your philosophy? What's your religion on culling? I think a lot of this comes down to if you were a film shooter back in the day, if you shot color negative film or if you shot a negative stock versus if you shot slides or chrome. Uh, if you shot negatives, you tend to fall into the keep everything camp. That means you keep every photo, you don't throw anything away. If you shot slide film or chrome, you would put all of your photos out on a light table and you'd look at them with the loop and you'd pick out just the best ones and you'd throw the rest of them away. Uh, you know, when I shot slide, you would throw 30 out of a roll of 36 away. There'd only be a handful left that were the ones that were good enough to keep. That's my firm philosophy on digital. And with digital, it's 10 times worse because we shoot so many more photos because they're free. My philosophy is I go through and when I'm doing my culling, I pick my favorite. If it's not a favorite, I pretty much throw it away. Now, that may not be practical if you're a professional photographer. There's a, there are certain photos you might need to keep, especially for an event like a wedding or something like that. There are certain photos that even though it may not wow you, it may not be a great photo, it is the one that you need to keep to tell the story correctly but it doesn't mean you have to keep every single photo. So I practice what I call optimistic culling. So when I go through, I mark things with my uh, P, the P flag for pick. Those are uh, my favorites. I'll then filter down to just the picks and I'll see if I've got enough. Do I have what I need? Uh, if that's it, I'm gonna take the rest and I'm going to literally delete them. I'm going to throw them away forever and ever. All right, let's start the yelling. What do you got, Nathan? I am frantically trying to answer as many questions as possible. That's why I put myself on mute because I'm typing, typing, typing as fast as I can. Um, Malcolm says, never throw away. I have found gold and discarded images. Just space is cheap. That's true. I believe the same. Yeah. Like I said, this is probably the most religious topic that, that we're going to get into is, you know, how much you keep, what you keep, what you throw away. Uh, and again, it's probably going to come down to uh, if you're shooting professionally or not, uh, in that you have to cover certain uh, topics within an event or you're trying to tell a larger story than what a single photo uh, can capture. That could be part of it, but don't let that be, I'm going to get real, people are going to really yell me now. Don't let that become an excuse or laziness for keeping every single photo. You're not doing your job of culling if you're keeping every single photo. Space is relatively cheap, but if you're shooting raw photos, that space can build up very quickly. And when it comes to backup or it comes to cloud storage, that cost becomes a real cost very quickly. All right. 
Dan, we do have a lot of questions around the catalog folders and mm -hmm. how they work and what's going on under the hood a little bit in the background. So do uh, Morris wants to, Maury notes would like to know, do the catalog folders exist on the drive as subfolders or are they merely a virtual placeholder to locate photos held in the various subfolders on your drive? Ah, so the catalog folder is a real folder. You tell it what you want to keep track of. So for example, I have told it, I want you to keep track of this folder called personal photos right here. And if I right click on this guy and I say show in the finder, do, take a second on the Mac to make it pop up here. There we go. That folder is a real folder on disk that we're watching. We're not creating any additional fake organizational construct. These are real files and folders on disk. We're just watching them wherever they happen to live. So you'll notice here under personal photos, those same folders you see right there are the same. And I've closed it. Let me open it up here so you guys can see it again. Oop. Oop. See that those folders here are the same folders you see right here. And if I drill down inside of these, it's all the exact same folders, real folders on disk. I would never do anything but real folders on disk. What else you got, Nathan? Well, here's kind of a tricky one, actually. A question about um, an anonymous attendee would like to know if they've got uh, kind of an older machine that maybe doesn't support On One Photo Raw 2020 and a newer machine that does and how they could work across machines and the best practices in that use case. Say, for example, they have an old Mac that uh, doesn't, doesn't support an operating system and they don't want to upgrade. Mm -hmm. um, what would you recommend in that situation, Dan? Hmm. That's a tough one, right? Hmm. I, I guess there there must be some reason why we're using that old system too. Uh, that would probably be, would help make that decision. I would say if my computer was too old to run a current version of Photo Raw, I don't see a need to keep that computer around unless there's some other dedicated function that we're keeping it for. Uh, yeah, I guess and see if the who or whoever asked that question, maybe you can explain why you want to keep that older computer around. So. What yeah, else, definitely. Um, oh, you want to talk about culling? We've got a bunch of questions about culling, how you can quickly cull a bunch of images. Dan, can you cull like Lightroom using a P and X? How does mm -hmm. it work? Yep, yep, that'll work exactly the same way. So let's go to that inbox folder where I had a whole bunch of stuff. And I'm going to go to a subfolder here. This happens to be some other ones that I shot with our mobile app. I was just messing around uh, one day in a local park. So for me to go through and do my culling, there's uh, a couple different views that you can use to get started. A lot of people will work here in grid view and they might just make their grid a little bit bigger. It's kind of a progressive process of working your way down, photos that you like versus photos that you don't like. So for me, I would start at this level and I would just start going through these photos with my arrow key. And I'm just gonna, sorry make a decision as to whether it's a photo that I like. Now, as again, I practice what I call that optimistic culling where I'm really just gonna keep the photos that I like and I'm gonna throw away everything I don't like. So I'm just gonna start arrowing through these photos, looking for anything that I actually like. You'll notice I haven't found a single photo that I like yet out of all these. These are all ones I just throw away. These are straight out of the camera, they're not interesting. All right, this one, we're starting to get something a little interesting. So I'll give it a P, give it a P, give it a P. And I would kind of work through the whole folder. I'm hitting the P key on my keyboard that is giving it this little heart right here. That's the like flag. That's the way I do it. You could also use stars is another way of doing it. A lot of people will hit the five star on their keyboard and that'll give it five stars. Just depends on what method you happen to prefer for that. Uh, then once I've gone through and I've done that first pass, I'm literally gonna pick anything that isn't a pick and I'm gonna throw it away. And then I'm gonna refine it even more because I really don't need all three of these photos. These three photos are really quite close to each other. So let's go through this whole folder. There's only like 87 photos. This will only take a second here. So I kind of like those, boring, boring. And these all have legs, but I need to understand them better to know if I'm gonna keep any of them. That one doesn't look too bad. Maybe, maybe, maybe. No, 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 no. Mm, something in here is gonna be interesting. Let's take a little closer look at them. No, 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 mm, maybe, mm, nope, 
maybe that one, maybe that one. All right, so I've gone through, I flagged the ones that I like, and now I'm just gonna filter down to pick everything that isn't a like. So the way you do that, watch this, we'll go over here to advanced search and turn it on. And I'm going to make sure it's set to filter current photos. That's the default unless you've changed it. And I'm going to say, find everything that is either unset or a discard. So these are all the photos that I didn't like, I didn't care for. All right, hold on to your butts. I'm gonna select all, hit delete. All right, I'm sure a bunch of people just cried, said, no, don't do it. Keep in mind, those are my trash. If I mess up, I can always go back and get them. I haven't deleted them from the world yet. They just live in my trash can. And now I'm down to just the ones that I actually like. So there's the ones that I like. Now, again, there's still too much here. I need to actually go through and look a little closer to figure out the ones that I really like out of these. So I'm gonna grab those first three photos. They're all highly similar to each other. And there's a couple different ways that I can look at it. The way I usually do it is I'll go into film strip view. Film strip view lets me see a larger version of that photo. And because I've made a selection, see how I picked one, two, three. As I arrow through those photos, it's gonna loop through those three. It's not going to go to the other ones. It's just gonna cycle between those three photos. So that lets me, makes it easy for me to kind of compare them and look at them a little bit closer. You can also use compare view, which is the button right next to it right here. If I click on compare view, this is actually gonna let me see all three photos at the same time. And let me look, and I can even zoom in on those at the same time. So I could click and I could zoom in. I'm gonna say lock the zoom and pan on these guys. That way they're all the same. So I'm zoomed into the same spot, the same amount on all those photos. And I can pan those and try to pick out which one is the sharpest. There's also a handy thing to do is to turn on the sharpness view. So if I go to window, uh, sorry, view and show focus mask, it's actually gonna highlight the photo in green where it's the most in focus. So I can actually arrow through these through photos and see which one is more in focus. Now yeah, they're all pretty much the same focus between those three. So that doesn't help me a whole lot, but a lot of times that can be handy, especially if you're looking for focus in a certain spot like eyes, it makes it easy to tell if eyes are in focus. But between these three, it's really gonna come down to composition, which one compositionally is the most interesting to me. They all look to be pretty much exposed the same, same amount of sharpness. So it's which one looks the most interesting to me to me, I kind of like this one because the tree branch is a little bit higher up here. So I'm just going to remove my like flag from the other two. So I'm going to say, get rid of you. And click on this one, get rid of you. And then I would just repeat that process. I would take the next series of similar photos and I would just go through those comparing composition and sharpness to pick the one that I like, removing the heart from any of the ones that are not my favorites and then throwing away the ones that are not the ones with the hearts on them. Awesome. Thank you, Dan. Evan actually had a follow-up for that question earlier. I, I mentioned Dan about um, using across old machines and his reason was that uh, he, he likes the size of his, of his iMac screen, but um, so he wants a bigger screen. So, you know, my recommendation to him would be you 4k monitors are really inexpensive. So I would go out and get yourself a, a larger monitor and connect your, your newer MacBook with that and set that up as your main workstation. You don't have to go buy a new brand new iMac just to uh, get more screen real estate. Yeah. Apple used to have this great feature called target display mode, where you could actually connect the laptop to an iMac and use the iMac as a screen for it. Unfortunately, they got rid of it like one or two OS versions ago. I have no idea why. I wish they'd kept it around. It was a great feature. So. Hey, um, we did have one question for you, Dan, on the, you mm -hmm. did a lot of like and picking there when we were just calling. Do you use ratings was the question? Like the star rating? Yes. Like the star uh, I don't think if I use the stars as much. I'll use that. Um, I don't have a consistent method for using the stars or mm -hmm. uh, there's also color labels. You use the same thing with color labels. Some people will use color labels to keep track of things within their workflow, which isn't a bad mm -hmm. way to go about it. You know, they'll say, if it's a green photo, I need to retouch it. If it's a red photo, I need to deliver it to a client. You can make those own rules for yourself and you can easily change those color labels just by clicking on this little color badge yeah. right here. And you could set a color label for a photo and you can search on those color labels as well. So if I'm only looking for my red photos, I can just come down here and click on the little red flag and it'll find just the ones that happen to be marked red, just like that. But uh, that's a more personal decision. There's not like a, a standard way of doing that. 
Um, yeah, definitely. I, and I would say, Dan, to anybody, um, because these there are a thousand different ways to organize and call and store and name and everything, go check out some of the video tutorials that we have on our website. It's on one.com slash videos. All of the plus courses are currently unlocked, so anybody can go in there and watch them. Hudson Henry actually has a fantastic method for doing ratings that I think is fascinating. So um, the way he do it, he does it is so five star photos would be like maybe he said he describes it as like maybe he'll take about 12 photos in his entire life you would consider five star and from down there he goes four star you know it's worthy of printing putting on its website three star you know good ones he wants to share so there's a lot of different ways that people organize and do that point being go check out some of those video tutorials because uh, everybody does, uh, does things a different way. I've got a lot of people in here saying, you know, they organize by date and folder structure and that's how I do it myself. And this leads me to my next question. Mark Stevens asks, um, do you have templates for suggested family folder structures? For example, I shoot thousands of family photos each year with hundreds of various subjects. I sort them all by year folders. Now, any recommendations for him? So for, for something like that, I tend to uh, do subfolders based on what it was, what the event was. If they're just the, uh, the average, I'm shooting around the house and I've got lots of miscellaneous photos like that. You know, to be honest, I haven't solved that one myself yet. I need to come up with a better solution for that one too. Uh, yeah, this is the perfect time, Dan. Yeah, I know, <laughs> I know. Aren't you supposed to screen these questions, Nathan? Uh, well, well, actually, do, I do the same thing. I have, I do, I did everything by years and months forever. And then six years later, I was like, why did I do it like that? I can't figure out where I went to the beach with my family last summer, if it was in July or August. And so then mm -hmm. um, I've slowly gone through the process of going back and started to rename things. And, and I'm like you, I'm not a huge keyword guy. And so it's starting to help. I, I really would recommend uh, naming the folders after something other than a date. And uh, that's kind of the Matt Kleskowski way of thinking too. Too. he's like what does 2015 mean it's like you know put 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 your shoots into different folder structures his method for doing is every time he goes out for a shoot he puts that into a folder essentially so this would be a single folder but anyways I, I would do it yeah every time you shoot put it in a folder do your work file that folder away uh, two other two other things I will mention so if you're using uh, photo raw is part of a workflow with other applications I would use the stars uh, rather than the than the heart. The star is a is a standardized metadata that's going to be visible in other applications. So if you're using Photo Raw and you're using it for culling your photos before you send it to an application like Lightroom, if you add a three star or a five star, you add a color label, those are going to appear inside of Lightroom as well or any other application that understands XMP metadata. It's kind of the standard way of, of doing metadata. Unfortunately, that little heart and the same thing with the little tick flag in Lightroom, those are not part of the metadata standard. So they're kind of uh, only going to show up in that, that application that you use. But you can do the same thing with stars. This is actually what I used to do before we had the, the tick flag is I would come into a folder, I'd take all my photos and I would set them all to three stars. And the three star was kind of the middle, middle rating. Then I would go through and I would five star the ones that I really, really liked. And I would one star the ones that were awful, that were out of focus or underexposed. I know I didn't want those at all. So then I would go through and I'd grab all the ones and I'd throw those away. Then I would take all the threes and I'd go through and I'd look at the threes and I'd decide, do any of these deserve to be bumped up to a five or do any of them need to be left as they are? And then I would take all the threes and then I'd throw them away. And then I'd be left with just the fives that were my favorite. Then I'd reset their, their rating on them and I could use the rating for something else later. So that's another way to do it. Definitely. All right. Let's well. see. We're running out of time here, here, and there's no more questions coming in, Dan. So. Uh -huh. Well, let me show you guys a couple quick things that I did want to show you. So one of the questions was, what do you do with your brackets, or what do you do with your panels? And I mentioned creating subfolders for doing that. So uh, let me go to something where I probably have a bracket in here. Oh, so here's one. Here's a bracket. And I happen to know this is probably a seven-shot bracket. One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven. So there's my bracket right there. I'm just going to right click and I'll say add subfolder. You notice how it's picked up the name of the first photo. It's going to name my subfolder that. And I'm just going to say move those items into that subfolder. There we go. It's now created a subfolder with that bracket name. And if I go inside of it, I'll see the photos that make up that bracket. 
I can even pick the one that I want to be my my poster child for that one if you want. And so let's say this is the frame that to me should show the top of that. And I'm going to say set my folder preview to that one. And then if I go back up, I see that folder right there. There's that folder. It's a bracket and it shows me the photo that I picked for. So that's what I do with brackets or series of similar photos. The great thing about that, again, is that is a real folder on disk now. So I can see that in any other application. It's not just an artificial construct like a stack. All right, uh, two other quick things to show you. Duplicate. A lot of times we get many duplicate photos because we've worked on multiple hard drives and things like that. We don't have a find duplicate feature yet. That is something that you guys are telling us are important to you. So I did want to show you at least one third party application. This is one for the Mac called Duplicate uh, Photos Fixer Pro. Uh, there's probably a bazillion of these apps out there. You just point it towards the folder and it will go through and it will find all of the duplicates. All the photos are exactly the same. So these are like the ones that I've shot with my iPhone. I've actually got 300 pairs of duplicate photos that live in here. I can have it automatically pick the best one, the best one based on the preferences that I tell it. So it's gonna pick the biggest one or the best file format or the original one, which everyone has the earliest modification date on it. And then I'll say trash marked. So it'll go through and it's gonna delete those 318 duplicate photos for me just like that, without me having to go through and do it manually. So I find that to be a super duper handy feature. Another one is for your iPhone. If you're working on a phone, there's another app out there called Gemini, which will scan through your photo library. And I think there's probably some others of these and it will find duplicates. It'll find those annoying screenshots that you take on accident in your pocket. It'll find all the boring photos of, you know, shopping lists and whiteboards that you don't want to import makes it really easy to go through and find and delete all the photos you don't want before you import them back to your computer. So uh, again, it's called Gemini. I want to say it's about $3. I think it's an excellent app. Nathan, you probably know some others that are similar to that. Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, I've, I used that, uh, clean my Mac a long time ago. I've got some experience using that. Um, sorry, Dan, I'm distracted getting through all the questions here. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of good questions actually. And another question people keep asking is like, uh, where can they find more information, Dan? And I'd like to show them if, if, if I could take the screen from you. Yeah, you bet. I will stop sharing and you can take over. All right, so I'm going to take you to the On One website is what you're looking at now. So if I go up here to the top, you'll see under the Learn tab, let me move my little screen, up my window here, so get this bigger. Under the Learn tab, I can go to Training Videos. And here is uh, where you can find all our on one uh, training videos. We do have our plus courses, which you can get to right here. If I click right there, they'll take you to our plus courses. And all of these courses are unlocked free for anybody to watch now. Non plus members can watch them too. If you like this topic, I, re I recommend digital asset management. And also another great one uh, that covers a lot of these topics would be landscape and travel photography. He gets into backup as well. Again, all these courses are unlocked and available to you. And while I'm here, if you want to watch more webinars, you can find all our webinars available here, the upcoming ones that we have. And of course, um, the ones like this that we're showing you today will get posted back here to the On One Video Library, just like the webinars we aired last week. And that concludes my wonderful presentation of the website. <laughs> A lot of great resources out there for you guys, so go check them out. Yeah. Thanks everybody for coming. I hope we uh, answered some questions or at least uh, made, made some folks think. Hopefully we didn't uh, anger too many people with my crazy ideas of organization. Mm -hmm. uh, I will recommend one thing and that is don't become overwhelmed by this. Take it step by step. And that's why I presented this in steps. Do step one, do step two, step three, and then don't try to organize and call everything all at once. Uh, kind of like cleaning your garage, you know, start in a corner, get yourself a clean spot and then start working your way around little bit by little bit. And then, you know, if you spend an hour a day for a couple of weeks, you'll finally have everything caught up and be nice and organized. And then it's way easier to keep things organized once you've got that foundation set up. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Dan, again. And we're getting a lot of thank yous in the chat comments here. Thank you, Malcolm. Thank you, everyone that attended today. Again, the entire presentation was recorded and will get posted to the video library here in just a few minutes. And I'll leave it to you to sign off. Dan, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Hope you had fun. All right. Thanks for joining. We'll see you guys later. Bye-bye.